Today's project and results are raw ale. It's safe to say that this is probably the most traditional farmhouse style out there. Basically what's going on with this style is there's a couple different ways to do it. After learning about the style, I was kind of hesitant about jumping into it. It kind of went against the grains of everything that we're taught as uh, home brewers, what is traditionally acceptable, everything that we've learned. But having dove into it and kept researching it because it was a really interesting sounding uh, style to me, I decided to dive into it and figure out a way to produce it that I felt comfortable with doing some sacrifices on uh, processes and uh, that I thought that was interesting. A uh, couple different techniques such as no boiling that was uh, pretty interesting and I think that that was a pretty big staple as far as raw ale went. I think if you boiled it then it's no longer a raw ale. And then another process and, and hot topic of debate is how to add the hops, uh, whether to do a hop tea, when to do it, how to do it. So I basically went ahead and used the recipe for that, that we've stuck with for the farmhouse uh, taste test. I've done quite a few farmhouses off of this as a test bed, so I figured why not use this, see what it tastes like. Basically, I guess you learn what the base recipe would be of all the ingredients mingled together without it being boiled, so that was a plus. What I did was I took that recipe, I didn't boil it, I mashed in as I would normal, uh, we mashed in at 152 for 75 minutes, or that's a 66.7 Celsius for 75 minutes. The grain bill is 70.1% Belgian Pilsner, 19.7% rye malt, and 10.3% torrefied wheat. After, so before the mash was complete, uh, when I mashed in, I went ahead and started boiling a hot tea. I felt like that that was probably the best way for me to introduce the hops, uh, the bitterness, and, and everything into this beer to help protect it a little bit, uh, be able to kind of get a little bit more of that, I guess, traditional raw ale uh, taste out of it. So I used the same hops that I did for the uh, farmhouse recipe, which is gonna be one ounce of East Kent Goldings at 60 minutes and one ounce of Saws in, uh, at five minutes for a total of 20 IBUs. So for the hop tea, we used uh, two quarts of water. I got it boiling, added that first dose in of the East Kent Goldings and then again, uh, the last five minutes of that boil, I added the, the saws and I tried to time it out well enough that whenever the mash was within about five minutes of being completed, that my hop tea was already done and it was ready to add within that last five minutes of, of mash uh, for a mash out, uh, so to speak. The thing about raw ale that I learned while researching it was that you wanted to keep the temperatures down below you know 175 180 thereabouts because you didn't want to uh, make a byproduct of the uh, dms so to prevent that I, I kept that mash temperature and then i pasteurized the wart at uh let's see here 165 degrees fahrenheit or 73.9 uh, degrees Celsius. So brought it up to that temperature. I held it for 15 minutes. According to a lot of things that I saw, like uh, the USDA standards for milk and things like that, you know, it was like less than five minutes to pasteurize milk or other products. So I figured at 15 minutes at that temperature, if it held it for that long, it would be as best as I could protect it 
against any kind of infections between the hop tea, the pasteurization, and then hurrying up and trying to move it into uh, fermentation. So when we moved into fermentation, I used Voss Quike. I figured with it being a raw ale and I'm trying to stay somewhat semi uh, traditional with it in that style of the like Norwegian farmhouse ales that uh, I would use the, the Voss Quike. So I used it the same way that I've used every other Quike. Uh, I underpitched it. I only used two tablespoons of it and I pitched it at uh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the way that I fermented it and kept it at that temperature is the same way that if you've seen the setups in the uh, Wizen series that I've done, uh, Wise Wizen, Wiser Wizen, all those, that insulated jacketed cooler bag that I have, and then I used an anvil temp controller and then I used a splitter plug with two heating pads on it and then I just had a, a bottle of water in it for the temp probe to go into to make sure that it held the temperature. So uh, during fermentation I noticed that we had slow slides of, of fermentation from the very get-go. This thing, uh, the starting gravity on it was 1.046 so Quike doesn't really like uh, low starting gravity beers. From my experience, uh, it likes 1055 and up. The higher, the better, the quicker it starts rolling. I did the standard thing that I do with all Quike. Uh, I, I doubled up on the yeast nutrients. And uh, so with the slow signs of fermentation, I, I let it ferment at that temperature for about a week. I saw all activity stop in the airlock. Generally, most of the time when I ferment with Quike, uh, it's done within about three days. So we pulled that fermenter out of the insulated jacket and uh, I set it off to the side. I took a gravity reading. It was it was still kind of high. It was like a 10, 10 at that point in time. And I was kind of baffled. I was like, man, I don't think this thing's done fermenting. So I let it hang out for uh, a few days I took another gravity reading it went down a few points so I said you know what I'm just gonna leave it it still still looks like it's got a little bit of active fermentation to it it kind of started taking off again just a little bit for just a, a few days so I let it hang out for about a week I went ahead took another reading it got down to 1.004 I read uh, I left that for three days I took another gravity reading it was the same reading I went ahead and gave it another day or two I took another reading it was still at 1004 so I figured at that point in time it's got to be done fermenting so after fermentation was done uh, we bottled it and so I started taste testing this thing about a week after it being bottled I don't normally taste test anything after being bottled conditioned for a month. I've learned most of the time that it, it tastes pretty bitter. It has that like green hop bitterness to it. So at that first week, uh, I had like a holy wow sensation of citrus taste. It just really popped. Um, it felt like it had a good like thickness to it, kind of like like the thickness that a stout does, which makes sense. There's a lot of proteins in here that are, are still left uh, because we didn't boil them out. It felt a little heavier, like I said, because of the proteins. So I tasted it again at week two. Now at week two, it had pretty much the same exact uh, feeling profile to it. It still had that citrus, strong citrus taste to it. I think uh, that's a characteristic of the Voss Quake. This is the first time that I've ever used uh, the Voss strain of this uh, series of yeast. Most of the time I use either Hothead or uh, Hornadol. I've used Lutra a few times. So it was, it's been interesting, but week two uh, it had the same exact uh, flavors. It was just kind of removed, well, a notch 
in the citrus. I was worried at that point because I had, I, as I was researching this before I brewed it, I learned that these things have kind of a short shelf life. And so most of the time they're drunk within a week or two of being ready. I thought maybe that I had missed it with that kind of stalled and slowed fermentation. And then I kind of drug my feet for about a week bottling it to just make sure that it was done uh, fermenting before bottling. So I thought maybe I was on the downhill side of, of the shelf life on it. So at three, week three, uh, I tasted it again and uh, it has moved into almost now like a creamy orange juice. Uh, I think it's kind of like blended a little bit more uh, together. Um, and it looks like it's cleaned up and cleared up a little bit uh, when pouring it. Before it was really like haze, uh, looking like a, like a hazy ice IPA or, or really uh, big like Hefeweizen or something like that. Had a lot of stuff floating around in it, which there again, of course, we're gonna have because of all the proteins that are left in there. So at this point in time, as of right now, we're between week three and week four on this uh, beer. So I don't know how much longer that I have left uh, in, sh in, in the shelf life of, of this thing. And so that's gonna be something that's gonna be interesting to uh, evaluate. Again, this has been bottled conditioned. Uh, it's been in the bottle for just over three weeks at this point. So as you can see, it's a, got a little bit of the chill haze to it, but I think a, a lot of that is all the particles and proteins that are still stuck in it. it has this very nice creamy head to it. It's had that since week one, which is a pretty cool, good tight bubbles around here. So it's a very pretty beer to look at in my opinion. Again, it's not clear by any stretch of the means, but it's got a good color to it. And this thing smells amazing. I, I really like the smell of this. Um, so when I tasted it the other day, like I said, it kind of had that creamy orange juice kind of taste to it. I wouldn't say like cream sickle or anything like that, but um, it, it, it had just this creamy orange juice taste to it. I don't know how else to explain it, but uh, off the smell, you know, it kind of has a little bit of even like the kind of banana that you would get off of Hefeweizen uh, to it. Still smell some citrus to it. The citrus has kind of died down on the on the aroma, uh, which is kind of disappointing at this point in time. I'm not a huge, huge citrus fan as far as that goes. But Still kind of has that uh, thick, creamy um, mouthfeel and taste. Got a good citrus taste on it. It's really these things are kind of hard to describe, and I I'm not that big of a or great of a descriptor yet. I'm still trying to figure all that stuff out. But uh, that's one thing that I've heard a lot of people say is is they're they're hard to they're hard to describe uh it's kind of like nothing you've you've ever tasted before i don't think so um I'm, maybe the closest thing that i could relate it to is almost a hefeweizen uh 
juicy-ish IPA, somewhere around there, but that's not even accurate there because it doesn't have any of the, the hop taste to it. So after this whole experiment, looking back, I made some uh, mistakes, of course. Uh, not that many. <laughs> Uh, they weren't that big. I didn't know how to account for some of this stuff, especially with no the no boiling. So when I tried to build it up, I ended up uh, about a gallon over on volume, uh, which I think kind of worked out for me. I was trying to shoot for this thing to be about a 5% beer. Most of the farmhouse ales that we've been doing here, they've been about 7 percenters, which there's nothing wrong with it. I just kind of wanted something a little bit more lighter. Uh, so with that extra gallon, it brought it to a 5.51% uh, after everything was said and done after it fermented out. This thing, uh, this thing, it's really, really interesting. I think that there's a lot of room for experiments and testing and playing with it. The one thing that I didn't do that I kind of wish that I could have done, I didn't take like that traditional uh, route of using uh, juniper bushes or juniper branches, I should say, for the infusion of uh, the water. Uh, and then I didn't use it to uh, do any rinsing of the grains or anything like that, like sparging with them. So, I mean, I did what I could. I don't really have any juniper around me that I know of. I did buy some juniper berries thinking that maybe I would try to throw them in the mash to be able to see, you know, what it would do. But after everything was said and done, I decided to try to make it as simple as possible to like get it a good feel for what a base would be for this this beer this style next time i think i will add uh, the juniper berries to it i'll probably maybe do some in the mash and then maybe some at a very like late addition uh for for it i probably would throw them in like maybe the last five minutes and maybe start off with half an ounce uh in the mash and then maybe throw another half ounce in at like the last five minutes of the mash, see if it would uh, do anything. I, I don't really know. I don't really have any exper experience with uh, juniper outside of a uh, dark saison that uh, was w brewed with uh, some ginger and to kill the ginger, I decided to throw some juniper berries at it. But so I also, for the water profile of this, I just used straight RO water. I didn't want to add any salts. I figured, try to mimic how it would be on the homestead, on the farmstead. Uh, you just got what you got. Uh, now, having said that, I went to the green store and bought greens and hops and you know things like that. Uh, some yeast for this this project, but. I figured, you know, try to stay as true to it as possible to not put any brewer salt salts in it. So I don't know. This this opens up a lot of possibilities. Of course, I want to try all the quite strains. Uh, I would really like to get my hands on some of the purer strains and, and not necessarily so much the commercial strains. There's a few that are definitely seem interesting. Um, of course, now that I've been playing with a lot of um, sours and uh, souring agents uh, for fermentation or post-fermentation, I kind of wonder what that would taste like. We got the juniper berries. I wonder how that's going to add up in the, into the mix. Uh, you know, I think with this style and if you just go like well what's on the farm what's on the homestead let's throw it in there and see what happens i think that you could come up with some very interesting uh some interesting beers here so this thing is like i said it's it's pretty awesome i'm pleasantly surprised every time that i've shared it with someone um i've told them about it 
and those that know about making beer were kind of surprised that it tasted as good as it did at week one in the bottle and that it was as carbonated as well as it was at week one and it's just uh it's, this thing is just cool <laughs> I, I look forward to playing with this look really forward to playing with this style uh the possibilities are endless so if you've made it this far into the video i would really like to hear uh some uh experiments that you've done in this line of raw l if you've brewed one if you haven't what are some of the things stopping you from doing it or what would you like to see done with a raw l that you think might be interesting for me to try to present here i don't know if i would necessarily do any of those spin-offs of uh three three at one time like i've done the wisens and the farmhouses or anything um, because i don't know how long the short shelf life is on 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 these beers so that that is a little worrisome i think next time that i do it i'm probably going to do a three gallon batch maybe a two and a half gallon batch and uh, see where that lands me um, that way i kind of decrease how, how much i have sitting around here if it suddenly goes bad it's not as big of a hit as, as uh, it, it would be with a five or six gallon batch. So thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, let us know anything in the comments that, like I said, you would like to see this style or what you've done with it so far. Bye. All right, so quick update on the raw ale. Um, it's been in the bottle for about a month now, just over a month. It's been I bottled it on the 3rd of November. It is now December 13th. So, like I said, just over a month. Something that we noticed the other day when we tried this uh, beer is it's still carbonated very well. It has a very good taste, the mouthfeel and everything. But it, I feel like it's starting to unravel a little bit. It doesn't taste nearly as nice and bright and full like it did before. As you can see, got a good bit of carbonation. Still very light in color. I would say that the citrus flavor that it had before has kind of died down now it's kind of moved into kind of almost the Hefeweizen type area where there's a little bit of a clove I feel like a little bit of a banana kind of creamy banana uh, taste to it it's not bad at all it's just it's starting to head towards where it wasn't before I don't know how much longer it's gonna last as far as being in the bottle um, all these were bottled conditioned so they've been hanging out in storage for a while at a uh, room temp I haven't chilled them out uh, other than for drinking and whatnot so top this off here real quick so as we finish the uh, trying to shoot this uh, video i think the last time that we talked about it it'd been in the bottle for just over three weeks right around there so we're at an additional week plus on this hence the month um like i said the the taste the mouthfeel everything about it as far as that goes no longer quite as sharp it's kind of dulled down some still tastes pretty good um, I think uh, probably the next step or so in it will will probably start fading into kind of being very bland tasting but it'll probably I guess retain the same carbonation as it has
again in and itself not bad by by any stretch of the means right now so it's been a pretty interesting style i think the next time that i do brew it it's going to be a smaller batch uh probably something two two and a half gallon or so and we'll just go from there on this style it's it's pretty pretty amazing and i think it's going to be fun to play with today we're talking about raw ale I had a whole thing planned out and it just went. 